a phone that plays music, connects to the internet, and displays HD movies. You thought it couldn't get any better. Then we added a garage door opener, TV remote, paper shredder, handheld vacuum, and scale. You thought you'd seen it all. You didn't think we could add a cheese grater, an electric air pump, a lip balm dispenser, a beard and nose hair trimmer, or a taser. You never thought you'd be performing LASIK surgery on yourself, fishing, or rotisserieing a chicken. What could we possibly add to a phone that can launch itself into suborbital space flight, predict the weather, detect the smell of fear, and indicate who your soulmate will be with 97% accuracy? How could it possibly get any better? Well, it has. Our latest accessory is Intercessory. A gentle electrical jolt reminds you to pray without ceasing. If you're unsure of who or what to pray for, just give it a shake and let a random apps of kindness pick for you. Or, if you just don't have time, use one of our pre-recorded prayers for all occasions. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. Thy phone. Solving life's dilemmas, one 3G prayer at a time. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we began this short series on prayer. And like I said in the beginning of the series, we all pray. Uh, according to a, a poll taken um, by USA Today, 9 out of 10 Americans say that they pray. And they pray for a variety of things. 98% pray for their own families. 81% uh, pray for the children of the world, you know, homeless or hungry kids all over the planet. 77% pray for world peace. 69% pray for their co-workers, which is nice to know if your co-workers praying for you. But like I said, we all pray whatever it is that we pray for. But wouldn't we like to pray more or better or deeper or with more faith and fervency? Some of us, I think, could benefit from a, a gentle electrical jolt reminding us to pray or a, you know, a pre-recorded prayer that we can just use for all occasions. But you know, even when we have really good intentions about prayer, we get busy and distracted, and, and our, our prayer life often falls by the wayside. And for some of us, prayer is sort of like a last resort. You know, it's what we do only in emergencies. I'm reminded of this church board meeting I heard about recently. It wasn't one of ours. Um, but apparently there were there was more agitation than agreement. And after a lengthy discussion, one of the deacons finally said, well, why don't we pray about it? And one of the elders quickly replied, has it really come to that? <laughs> Maybe you can relate. Maybe your prayer life is kind of as consistent as the weather here in Illinois is. But, but if that's the case, what do we do when we stumble upon a, a passage like this one? In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, where Paul says, pray without ceasing. It's hard for us to, to wrap our minds around that. Pray without ceasing, as in all the time. And surely God can't be serious. Maybe another translation will, will let us off the hook. The NIV, for instance, says this, pray continually. Well, that's not any better, is it? Or uh, the Holy Christian Standard, it says, pray constantly. Still no good for us. How about the, the New Living Translation? It says, never stop praying. Never stop praying. And what do we do with, with passages like that? I mean, is that even possible? Many years ago, Frank Lawback set out to discover the answer to that very question. Like us, Frank was busy. You know, he, he authored several books. He advised presidents. He traveled all over the globe speaking on topics of literacy and world peace. But he was also a, a committed Christian who loved God as much as any of us could. And in a letter that he sent to a friend, he writes this. He says, can we have contact with God all the time? All the time awake? Fall asleep in his arms and awake in his presence? I choose, he says, to make the rest of my life an experiment in answering this question. And he documented his experience in his journal. I won't read the whole thing to you, but five months into this experiment, five months into it, on May 14, 1930, Frank writes this. He says, Oh, this thing of keeping in constant touch with God, if, uh, of making Him the object of my thought and the 
companion of my conversation. This is the most amazing thing I have ever run across. It's working. I cannot do it even half a day, not yet. But I believe I shall be doing it someday for the entire day. It is a matter of acquiring a new habit of thought. And then 10 days later, on March, May 24th, he writes this, This concentration upon God is strenuous, but everything else has ceased to be so. Isn't that great? Everything else has ceased to be strenuous. I think more clearly, he says. I forget less frequently. Things which I did with a strain before, I now do easily and with no effort whatsoever. I worry about nothing. How many of us like to be able to say that? I worry about nothing. I lose no sleep. I walk on air a good part of the time. Nothing can go wrong except one thing, and that is that God might slip from my mind. What do you make of this experiment? What if you learned to pray unceasingly? Now, what would you be like? Would people notice the difference? And your family, would they see something new? Your co-workers, would they sense a change? And what about you? What alterations would a life of unending prayer have on, on your stress levels? Your mood swings, your temper. Uh, would you sleep better? Would you see sunsets differently? Is it even possible? Now, I'm, I'm no expert on prayer, and I'm certainly no Frank Lawback, but I'd like to share with you a few suggestions that have helped me in my own prayer life. Four simple suggestions for getting started in your own uh, unceasing prayer experiment. First, I want to encourage you to give God your waking thoughts. Now, I'm reminded of a, a mother who prayed, Dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, I haven't lost my temper, I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, or selfish, or overindulgent, and I'm very thankful for that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed, and from then on, I'm going to need a lot of help. I don't know about you, but I've, I've prayed some similar prayers in my life. I think there's something uh, particularly important about praying first thing in the morning. It sets the whole tone for the day ahead of us. And apparently Jesus thought so too. The Bible tells us in Mark 1 verse 35 that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus made prayer a priority in his life. And I'm convinced that he started every day in prayer. Don't you think we should do the same thing? Amen. I like what C.S. Lewis once said about prayer. He said... The moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. That's what we do when we pray. Now, some days I let those wild animals get the better of me. You know, maybe the kids wake up arguing or the alarm doesn't go off and i got to get up and rush into the day. But on my better days, before I even open my eyes, I pray. I thank God for another day of life. I, I lay my schedule at His feet and, and I ask Him for His help with whatever it is I have to do that day. I ask Him to fill me with His Spirit to make me a better hus husband and a better father and a better pastor. And not every day begins that way for me, honestly. But I'll tell you what, the days that do begin that way are much better days. Martin Luther was a man of prayer. He once wrote a 40-page paper, a 40-page letter, that is, to his barber, Peter Beskendorf, because he asked him how to pray. And this 40-page paper was Martin Luther's response. And no, I won't read the whole thing, but there's a very short excerpt from it, where Martin Luther says, guard yourself against such false and deceitful thoughts that keep whispering, wait a while. In an hour or so, I will pray. I must first finish this or that.
thinking such thoughts, he says, we get away from prayer into the things of the day that will hold us and involve us until the prayer of the day comes to nothing. It's a good thing, he says, to let prayer be the first business in the morning and the last in the evening. That's good advice, don't you think? I won't read the whole 40-page paper. I don't think you'd want to either, but, but that little bit is good advice. And certainly David would have agreed. He writes in Psalm 5, verse 3, he says, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. Isn't that a great way to start the day? You start the day laying your requests at the feet of Jesus and then just wait for him to answer. Wait and see what he does. That's how I think we ought to start our days. So, so my fr first bit of advice is to give God your waking thoughts. Start each day with, good morning, Lord, and then just go from there. Secondly, I would suggest giving God your waiting thoughts. Your waiting thoughts. Have you ever considered how much time just gets lost in your day and in your life? The folks at Priority Management Incorporated decided to try and find out. And according to a study that they conducted, over the course of your lifetime, the average American will spend five months tying their shoes. Five months tying their shoes. You'll spend six months sitting at stoplights, just waiting for that light to turn green. You will spend eight months opening junk mail. That's probably twice as much in my case because I go through the church's junk mail and there's a lot of that too. You'll spend two years looking for lost items. And I'll tell you what, this study was done before cell phones were as common as they are. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was doubled by now. Two years just looking for that stupid phone and looking for your keys and whatever else it is you lost. And then one more thing they found, you will spend five years, five years of your life Standing in various lines. Just standing in line. In line at the checkout counter, in line at the DMV, in line at the doctor's office or the dentist's office. Five years of your life just spent waiting in line. And a new Nielsen report tells us that the average American over the age of two watches an average of 34 hours a week of live TV. 34 hours a week, which equates to two years of your life, not spent watching TV, spent watching commercials during the shows that you're watching on TV. Two years of your life just watching commercials, just waiting for the show to come back on. But you know what the Bible says about waiting? In Romans 12, verse 12, it says this, Be patient and pray at all times. Be patient and pray at all times. What if we actually tried to do that? What if all the time that we spend waiting in line or sitting at stoplights or looking for lost keys or even tying our shoes became an opportunity to connect with God? You know, what if every time you notice loose laces, you just use that as a reminder to, to say a, a short prayer, asking God to, to walk with you throughout your day? Or what if you know, every stoplight became a cue to pause? and to think about God and to pray to Him and thank Him for being with you? Or what if we use those five years that we spend waiting in line as an opportunity to commune with our Heavenly Father? You know, you can pray for the person in line in front of you or for the person in line behind you or just pray for the line to move a little bit quicker. You know, whatever it is you pray for, just use that time to pray. Just by praying while tying your shoes and waiting at stoplights and waiting in line or muting the TV and praying during commercials, you could literally spend eight years of your life in prayer. Eight years of prayer. Imagine how much deeper and stronger your relationship with God would be just by giving God your waiting thought. Your waiting thought. Now third, I want to encourage you to give God your worrying thoughts. <coughs> your worrying thoughts. You know, a fellow pastor recently shared a story with me of a, a trip that he took with his five-year-old to McDonald's one day. And as they turned onto the main road, he saw a car accident up ahead. And, you know, they, in their family, they usually, when they see something like that, they'll pause and they'll say a quick prayer for, you know, anyone who might have been injured or whatever. 
And so he saw the accident and the lights and stuff up ahead, and he gets his son's attention and says, hey, buddy, let's pray. And then he hears this earnest request coming from the back seat. Please, God, don't let those cars block the entrance to McDonald's. <laughs> we know what he was worried about, right? <laughs> but just like that little boy, you know, we ought to take every worry, every care that we have and just lay it at the feet of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, verse 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry, just pray. And we are an anxiety-plagued people, aren't we? And we worry about how we're going to pay the bills at the end of the month. We worry about our relationship, our marriage, our kids, our boyfriends, our girlfriends. We, we worry about work. We worry about our health. We worry about fitting in and being good enough or smart enough or pretty enough or thin enough. I mean, heck, we, we just had a, a women's conference here a couple weeks ago all about worry because that's what we're good at. We worry a lot. But instead of letting our worries steer our thoughts, what if we let them drive us to our knees? Corey Ten Boom once said, any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to become a burden. You know, if it's too small to pray to God about it, and you shouldn't be worrying about it. Well, let's take a, a closer look at that verse, though. Philippians 4, 6. This is the rest of it. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Can you imagine never worrying about anything? And it seems like an impossibility. We all have worries, but Paul's advice is to turn our worries into prayers. So whenever worry starts to creep up on you, just stop and pray. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for what He's done. And not only will our thankfulness kind of cast aside those fears and worries, but you'll draw closer to God in the process. You'll experience His presence and His peace by stopping and praying. So give God your worrying thoughts. And finally, one last thing suggestion. Give God your waning thoughts. Your waning thoughts. Again, as, as Martin Luther said, it is a good thing to let prayer be the first business in the morning and the last in the evening. And I think David would have agreed again. He, he prays in, in Psalm 63 verse 6, As I lie on my bed, I remember you. Through the long hours of the night, I think about you. During Sleepless, uncomfortable nights, David prayed, and he focused his thoughts on God. Instead of counting sheep, he, he counted on his Savior. As, uh, as this song continues, though, David, he just starts listing things. It's almost like, uh, like counting his blessings. Listing ways that God has been there for him, and, and thanking him for, for helping him in this situation and that situation. And I think if we did the same thing, we might sleep a little bit better. Can you relate to David's sleepless night? According to a, a 2002 poll by the National Sleep Foundation, most of us can. 63% of women and 54% of men experience symptoms of insomnia at least a couple of nights every week. So over half of us wrestle with insomnia on a regular basis. And sleeplessness is often a symptom of an overloaded life. Several years ago, uh, a Tahoma, Washington newspaper carried the story of Tattoo, the Basset Hound. I told you guys about that. Uh, Tattoo didn't intend to go for an evening run, but when his owner accidentally shut the end of his leash in the car door, he really didn't have much option. Uh, the owner of the car backed out and drove down the street, and, and the dog just tried to keep pace. Motorcycle officer Terry Filbert Poor Basset Hound was picking him up and putting him down as fast as he could. He pulled the car over and Tattoo was rescued, no harm done. But not before the dog reached a top speed of 25 miles an hour. And too many of us, I think, are living our lives like Tattoo, just picking him up and putting him down as fast as we can, you know, as if we're just being dragged through life. So, so when your head hits the pillow and your feet might stop running, but your mind doesn't. And that's why I think it's so important to, to give God our waning thoughts. Did you know the Bible says in, in Psalm 121, verse 4, Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers 
or sleeps. God never sleeps. Did you know that? And you know what? Since God never sleeps, there's no sense in both of us staying up, right? Might as well let him worry about it. Instead of, of staying up and worrying or, or thinking about whatever it is that's going on, you can turn your, your final thoughts over to God. You can praise Him for another day. Tell Him what you need. Thank Him for what He's done. And then just leave tomorrow in His hands. It's still going to be there when it arrives anyway. Now, I'm still no expert on prayer, like I said. And I, I, I wrestle with uh, being able to pray for periods of a time without my mind wandering. As soon as my eyes close, my mind wanders. Distractions swarm like gnats on a summer's day. Uh, so for now, I, I choose to keep my prayers short but frequent throughout the day. And in my effort to pray unceasingly, I try to give God my waking thoughts, my waiting thoughts, my worrying thoughts, and my waning thoughts. And I want to encourage you to do the same. And please understand that prayer isn't just another thing that we do. Prayer should never be a burden itself. Prayer is, is what empowers us to do all the things that we have to do. Before I close, let me share a, a poem with you. I don't know who the author is, but it could have been any one of us, really. It says simply, I got up early one morning and rushed into the day. I had so much to accomplish, I didn't have time to pray. Troubles just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wonder? The answer, you didn't ask. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. But God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I called for the Lord for a reason, and he said, you didn't seek. So the next morning, I got up early and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Maybe your prayer life is in the same boat. Now, maybe you need to pray a little deeper or stronger or more frequently. But listen, the best solution is to just start praying. So, uh, so maybe we can do that together right now. In fact, why don't we pray together? Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for this gift of prayer. And at the same time, we confess our tendency to neglect it. You open the doors of communication and you invite us to pray without ceasing, to pray about everything constantly and continually. Help us to recognize your presence and to turn our thoughts toward you. Help us to experience constant communion and companionship the way that you intended. Let us fall asleep in your arms and awake in your presence. And all the time in between, Lord, let us remember that you are there, that you are listening, and that you love us. We praise you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen.